system. It's all coming in because only humans have the ability to store explicit memory. We store billions and billions of bits of information, and this is stored in this explicit memory system. Animals don't do that. So what happens is, is that when our minds recall data, memory from five years ago or 10 years ago, the subconscious mind is seeing it in real time because your subconscious mind is survival based and it only deals what's happening now. Hey everyone, welcome back to the reshape your health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Morgan Nolte. And I'm really excited about our conversation today. I was connected to our guest by Esther Blum, who's been on this podcast multiple times. We were talking offline about trauma and she highly recommended Dr. Don Wood. And so I reached out and he graciously agreed to come on the podcast to talk about trauma and healing from trauma and ways that trauma can manifest um, in depression and anxiety, PTSD, and physical health um, ailments. So I think this is going to be a really interesting and enlightening and educating conversation today. Dr. Don Wood is a PhD author, speaker, founder, and CEO of the Inspired Performance Institute and creator of the Inspired Performance Program or TIP method. He's also the author of two top selling books, emotional concussions, and you must be out of your mind. His tip method uses the newest developments in neuroscience to clear away the effects of disturbing or traumatic events, repurpose old patterns and prime your mind for peak performance. The tip method resets or reboots the brain that has been stuck in this fight or flight mode because of the trauma and helps people move on from trauma, depression, anxiety, and PTSD. I'm so excited for this conversation. Dr. Don, thank you for joining us today. Can you just get started with a bit of your story and how you got into this field? Yeah, it's very interesting, Morgan. I, I started off because if I talk about my childhood and compare it to my wife and daughters, I had this idyllic childhood. I had amazing, I was adopted. I had incredible parents that never argued, never wrote, raised their voice. Uh, I was living in this utopia. I didn't know it at the time. I thought everybody did. And it really wasn't until, because a lot of my friends never talked about the traumas they were dealing with, the physical, emotional, sexual abuse. That was always quiet. Nobody ever talked about it. And so when I met my wife, I was 18, and we got close very quickly because I had a chance to go and play professional hockey in Sweden. So we got engaged at 19, and we were going to go over. Now I'm around her house all the time, and I see the dysfunction going on in the house. I could sense there was a tension, but I didn't see it enough. And then eventually they couldn't hide it. Um, her father was a very angry man, very violent. So all the children and the mom and the grandmother in that house were living in fear of him. And that was ongoing and constantly, you know, her, her nervous system. I always talk about activations. I never talk about triggers. I say our nervous system gets activated. I just never liked the word trigger. I thought it sounded violent and negative. And your system's not violent or negative. It's trying to protect you. So she was living, you know, in that world, I thought when we get married, all that fear will go away because she'll be living in the type of world I grew up in, but it wasn't. It just continued to activate her nervous system with something as simple as me saying, no, I don't like that. She could tear up and start to cry and say, why are you upset with me? Absolutely. And I didn't understand it at the time. I was thinking, well, how did I say that? And I started to think, okay, I've got to choose my words more carefully. I've got to be careful of the tone in my voice, but it would take very little to activate it. And then when my daughter turned 14, she was diagnosed with Crohn's and they told us there's no cure for Crohn's. We don't know what causes Crohn's. She needs to take, be off of dairy and gluten and change her diet. And, and she ended up having four resections done where they literally went in and took out 24 inches of her intestines over four operations. So she really struggled and suffered. 
And then they said, you know, there's no answer for it. She'll eventually end up with a colostomy bag. Mm -hmm. And then uh, later she ended up developing another autoimmune disorder called idiopathic pulmonary hemosiderosis, which is where the iron and the blood gets released. And so we got a call that she was rushed to the hospital. She was coughing up blood. And they just said, again, this is what they diagnosed as hemosiderosis, said there's no cure for it. There's no cause. We don't know what causes it. Same kind of thing. And that's when my wife said, you need to figure this out. You were adopted. This must be coming from some genetic side, <laughs> from your side. It was my fault, right? And if you don't figure out an answer to this, we're going to lose our daughter. So that's what started me on the research to figure out why are these things happening? And that's really how I developed the whole program. What was your, so you were, went to play professional hockey, but then you went and got, did you get your PhD later in life? Later in life. Yeah. Well, not until I'm my fifties. What was your first profession? I was always an entrepreneur. So I was in the financial services, mortgages, real estate, insurance, and I've always just been a lifelong entrepreneur, yeah. which I think was actually an advantage when I yes. went to research it because I wasn't coming in to learn what they wanted to teach me. I came in with an agenda of trying to figure out why are they not fixing this? Right. So, so it's sort of a different kind of approach, which is what a entrepreneur would do. Find out yeah. where the problem is and solve the problem. Absolutely. So let's talk about first off, why do you feel like it took you till you were 50 to go get your PhD to figure this out? What was the impetus? Like why such a long lag time? Because if you were married young and you knew that some of this was going on for years and years in your marriage, I'm just kind of curious why the lag time? Well, my wife was high functioning. So it wasn't like she was like struggling every day. I could see the struggle, but if you had met her, you would never have known. But I just saw that she was constantly living in fear. And I had no idea what was causing it. And I, and I couldn't come up with an answer. And it wasn't like she was you know, having a drinking problem, drug problem. She was just struggling with this. And one of the things that I look back on now and I realize is that even though we had a really good life, three beautiful children, a beautiful home, good business, she wasn't enjoying it. She, and it wasn't that she was ungrateful. She just couldn't get into that feeling of happiness. And it really came back again to her childhood because she was afraid it was going to stop because there were times where dad would be okay. And then all of a sudden the violence would start again. So she was protecting herself from getting too excited about things going well so that she didn't get hurt when they stopped. Okay. And, and again, it wasn't until my daughter really ended up with that second disorder that it was like, if we don't do something, she's probably going to die from this. Right. And that started me going, looking. Okay. So we talked offline that a big issue when it comes to dealing with trauma is just not even seeing the trauma, not even recognizing the trauma and then having so much resistance to talk about it, um, or masking. I feel like people are really good. Maybe your wife is a good example of masking the trauma, even subconsciously. So can you just bring to our awareness, what counts as trauma um, what are some signs that we might be masking unresolved trauma? And then lastly, I want to talk about why is there so much resistance to healing from trauma? Well, the, the big thing is, is a lot of people who have, some people know exactly what their traumas are. You know, they can tell you what, what happened. Uh, but there's a lot of times that people don't realize it. Like I worked with one person who had from the Boston Marathon, an obvious trauma. And that's what she thought was her trauma. But once we got into the program, she realized my trauma was my childhood. This was just one more piece of it. And she didn't realize how much that she had to resolve from her childhood to even address what was the current one, which we thought was the most obvious one. And so a lot of times, the best way that I can explain it is if you want to know if you have unresolved trauma is if you think about an event that happened to you, say, 10 years ago, and you feel an emotion, fear or anger, then it means it's active. Because anytime you have an emotion, fear or anger, your mind is calling for an action. The purpose of fear is to escape a threat. The purpose of anger is to attack a threat. 
So if you think about something from 10 years ago and your heart's pounding in your chest, your mind is actually calling you into an action that isn't possible. It wants you to fix it, but you can't fix it. But your mind keeps looping through the data and keeps seeing it's, it's actually a glitch. That's why I always say, Morgan, to people, there's nothing wrong with you and there's nothing wrong with your mind. Your mind is looping through some old data, continually calling you into actions that are impossible. So yeah. does that make sense? It makes total sense. And I think I personally have had those looping thoughts and I, um, would say it was like, I was watching a movie on repeat that I couldn't shut off yep. and I didn't know how to shut it off. And it probably, I mean, it took a couple of years, you know, really to shut it off. And I think that it's off now. I don't know how I did it. I'm hoping you can bring some insight into a more systematic approach of healing to expedite the process. Um, so I think some resistance too, that we have to talk about is the guilt, the shame. Um, maybe it was sexual trauma or maybe they went through something where they were the person at fault, you know, for the trauma. Um, or maybe it's just embarrassing. Like I know that you you mentioned that your wife didn't really want her story to be public for a long time. So she had that resistance to sharing the trauma. I could imagine that sometimes people might be, um, afraid of facing the trauma again and experiencing those feelings of, um, anger, um, or, you know, they want to fight them or they want to run. And they're just like, I can't, I don't have the emotional capacity to go through this right now. So what are some of those big things that you see as resistance to going through and healing from this trauma? Well, I think that's the big thing. When my wife, uh, before we got married, she said to me, um, okay, I want to sit down and talk to you about the trauma I've had in my life, because that may change your mind about wanting to marry me. Right? <laughs> and so I was like, at first, I was like, wow, is there something I really don't know? And as she shared what she'd experienced as a child, right? She thought that that would change the way I thought about her. And I said, no, that doesn't change it at all. Right? You are a child. But in her mind, there was a lot of shame about that. She didn't want people to judge her, judge her family about what they had gone through. So that's generally why people don't want to talk about it. Plus, if she tried to talk about it, she'd break down and cry. So who wants to deal with that? So right. if you just ignore it and don't talk about it, you don't have to face it. And so that's a big thing. Plus, again, a lot of my friends were being sexually abused. We found out that two principals at our schools, two teachers at our schools, the guy ran our little league, all my friends had dealt with it. And I had none of it, wow. which I think was sort of my wife says we were the perfect Petri dishes for this because I at least knew the model of what it was like to live without that trauma. You know, and I get bumped every once in a while, but nothing big. And so, you know, like somebody saying something to me or a friend arguing with me but no big kind of trauma. So I've been healthy my entire life. I played hockey, which is a pretty violent sport. I had 60 stitches in my head, six concussions, and never missed a hockey game. Wow. I played right through it. And I believe that was possible because my nervous system stayed in regulation. So I got maximum maintenance. So mm -hmm. if I'm getting two or three times the maintenance sleep that my teammates are I'm healing two or three times faster. It was really that simple. I think that the next thing I wanted to talk about was how do these childhood traumas manifest later in life? Um, so we have that resistance of like, they're afraid that someone's going to judge them or we're, we're taught so often to make other people comfortable and clearly opening up and crying typically <laughs> makes people a little bit uncomfortable. Um, so just getting over that fear of judgment, getting over that fear of making someone else uncomfortable. Um, but let's talk about like, how does it manifest? Because I work with a lot of people with health issues or fatigue, um, or self-destructive behaviors, to be honest. Right. So why does trauma sometimes result in that later in life? Well, I, I equate it to, it's like getting in your car, stepping on the gas all the way down to the floor but using the brakes to keep you going 30 miles an hour, right? So you're constantly trying to look 
you know, in control, everything is fine, but your system is running on overdrive and it's taxing the whole system. So you're going to get adrenal fatigue. You're going to have all kinds of health issues that are showing up because a fight or flight response is an emergency management system. And it is in the animal world, works perfectly in the animal world. If there's a threat, you respond to the threat. If there's no threat, you should be at peace. The problem is, and this is where the whole thing comes in from what I've you know, sort of worked on with the program. It's all coming in because only humans have the ability to store explicit memory. We store billions and billions of bits of information. And this is stored in this explicit memory system. Animals don't do that. So what happens is, is that when our minds recall data, memory from five years ago or 10 years ago, the subconscious mind is seeing it in real time because your subconscious mind is survival based and it only deals what's happening now. It's the same way animals, animals are 100% subconscious. Everything for them is happening now. 95% of our mind is the same subconscious responding to everything in real time. So can you see where a glitch, an error message is going to show up? If something reminds you a smell, a sound, a name, or you talk about something that happened to you 10 years ago, what does your mind have to do? It has to start reviewing the old memory. And it, when it sees that memory, it activates the nervous system and you go into a fight or flight response, even though nothing's happening. But you're not consciously aware of that. You just know you feel the emotion. Yep. And so that emotion is going to call for an action, but the action yep. is possible. Or it can pr uh, produce a self-destructive or a non-productive action. So I just think of like a micro T trauma. Let's give a really practical example here of someone who, um, when they were growing up, their parent, um, maybe it was their mom, maybe it was their grandma. They were like, you need to not eat that. Look at that girl. She's so thin and pretty. And so that was traumatic to them in the sense that they felt like they weren't pretty and they felt like they weren't enough unless they were thin and they felt like they weren't loved and they weren't secure in that relationship unless they were thin. And then it kind of triggers this lifetime of obsessing over food and over weight. So can you kind of like draw that thread of how does that micro trauma then manifest in kind of chronic overeating because you would think, or chronic dieting perhaps, because you would think that, you know, over a decade, two decades, three decades go by. And someone's like, oh my gosh, I'm still letting what my grandma told me 30 years ago impact my behavior. So can you explain that just a little bit for us? Sure. The, Cause that's all happening on a subconscious basis. The number one fear for the human mind is uncertainty. Our minds do not like uncertainty. And so if, and especially this happens for very young children who don't have a lot of life experience to interpret what their parents said. Yeah. For example, you know, I had a lady say to me, she was in church, she was six years old and she was talking and her grandmother took out her hairbrush and hit her on the head and said, stop talking, you're in church. And she started to sob uncontrollably saying, I lost my voice that day. What the six-year-old heard was, we don't want to hear from you. Now, that's not what her grandmother was trying to do, right? But a six-year-old doesn't know that. And then we attach a whole bunch of meanings to it, especially as children. I find a lot of these events are coming back to very young ages before the age of seven. Mm -hmm. And so that's when there's a lot of trauma created, sometimes unintentionally by yep. a parent. Yep. You know, another lady who came in, she always, that's what the emotional concussions books is all about. As I talk about, here are 10 things that can show up, right, from these emotional concussions. For example, this lady procrastinated all the time. Why did she procrastinate? And she says when she, her mother was a principal at a school. And so whenever she would do her homework, her mother would make her bring it to her. And she'd redline it all about all the mistakes she made. So what she had learned is that every time I do work, I get it wrong, right? Now, her mother's not trying to do that. Her mother's trying to help her. But a young child is like, I never get it right. So the longer she can put off that pain 
of being told she's wrong. So you get down to a point where there's a deadline, you can't do anything about it. You got to just take it. That's yeah. what her mind was trying to do to stop her from the pain. It's all coming down to stopping pain. Pain is a very major motivator for the brain. It wants to avoid pain at any cost. Right. So what are some other manifestations from that emotional concussions book? So procrastination was one to avoid the pain of feeling like you never get it right, or you never get it good enough, perhaps. What are some other ones that might be um, relevant to my audience? Because procrastination is certainly one of them. Is a big one. Yeah. Um, blaming other people. So yeah. when something goes wrong, it's somebody else's fault. So that may have come in early when you were younger, you constantly were criticized. Maybe you're the older sibling. Everything, everything that went wrong was your fault, right? So those kinds of things, you know, um, getting out of your lane, trying to please everybody all the time, always looking for that reassurance that I'm safe. And that's where a lot of it comes down to. It's a safety message. Our mind wants to feel safe because a thousand years ago, if the, if the tribe excommunicated you or your parents, right, you know, pushed you out, right, you weren't safe. You're surrounded by danger. So your mind would try to get out of danger. And so if I can keep everybody happy in the tribe, all right, I'm safe. Mm -hmm. So I think that procrastination is a huge one. Um, blaming others. Like what, is this a good example of like, well, I was at a party and I wasn't going to eat anything like unhealthy, but then I just kind of said, screw it. And I had all of the dessert but I couldn't help myself because it wasn't available. And my husband was making me do it. I hear that a lot. Like, <laughs> yeah. and my husband's a food pusher. Is there anything from that, that kind of like maybe a lack of personal responsibility for their choices? Could that somehow stem back to trauma earlier in life? Sure. Fitting in, right? If everybody else is doing it, I'm going to do it as well, because then I don't stand out. I don't become isolated. So if you got bullied a lot as a child, right? And all of a sudden, now you're in a group of people, you want to be invisible. You don't want people to draw attention to you. So how do you do that? I'll drink with everybody else. I'll eat with everybody else, right? To not stand out. It could also be coming from pain. So when they eat, they feel better. Mm -hmm. So that often shows up in addiction. So when people come in and I, and I work with them in addiction, I say the same thing. There's nothing wrong with you and there's nothing wrong with your mind. You had pain and you found a resource to stop the pain, right? Of course, your mind's going to try to stop the pain. So a lady came in and she said she'd been on heroin for seven years. And she says, I told my therapist I was coming to see you. And he told me to be honest and let you know I have self-destructive behavior. And I said to her, I said, really, what would make you think you're self-destructive? <laughs> and she looks at me, she goes, my God, I'm sticking a needle with heroin in my arm. Don't you think that's self-destructive? I said, no, I don't. I think you're trying to feel better. And I'll bet you when you stuck the needle in your arm, you felt better. She goes, yeah. And I said, that's not self-destructive. I says, now the substance you're using is destructive, but you're not. Your mind was trying to stop the pain and you found a resource to stop the pain. What if you could do that without taking a drug? And I can show you how your brain is capable of doing it all on its own. It doesn't need that resource. You just didn't know that. So you had, that's a resource you found. I said, I've never had a drink in my life, never touched a drug in my life, but I never had your pain. If I'd had your pain, I would have found a resource similar to yours, if not the same one. Yeah. I think first of all, I just wanted to acknowledge your skill in this area for anyone who's listened to me for a long time. You know, that I'm a fan of soft, non-dramatic language because that's more, um, it's, it's easier for your brain to feel good with soft, non-dramatic language. And so I just wanted to highlight how soft and non-dramatic the language that you're using is. And for listeners, I want you to pay attention to that softness and that gentle language that Dr. Don is using and compare it to your own internal dialogue and really try to work on your own internal dialogue of how you're speaking to yourself. And, um, I feel like, I, I feel like I could use a little bit more Dr. Don in my life because I'm very cognizant of this, 
but I still use some of those self-destructive, like self-destructive, or we talked about trigger maybe offline, but there are still words in my vocabulary that aren't as soft and gentle as I want them to be. So thank you for being a great example of that. Number one. Um, but my question was, okay, I can maybe list a couple memories, two, perhaps three from before I was seven, where I didn't feel safe, Mm -hmm. where I didn't feel loved. And I'm guessing that if I had to tell you like, okay, those would probably be my best guesses as any source of child of childhood trauma. But I feel like when a lot of people go through trauma or maybe like they're in their fifties or sixties and they're thinking how, I don't know what happened like before I was seven, how am I supposed to get to the root cause of this? So my question is, how do you help people uncover the root of the trauma? Like that Boston marathon runner, you know, who it started with the Boston marathon, but then it ended up in childhood. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, it's really interesting. It's a great question because same thing. I I appreciate those kind words about, but my whole program is all built on that is, as you can tell, when I say there's nothing wrong with you and there's nothing wrong with your mind, I know exactly why your mind is creating these emotions, right? So, but what we do is the process that I use takes four hours and I, and I have a specific reason why I use the four hours for two hours. We never even talk about trauma. All we do is talk about the science and the education of what I learned through all my research and why these things are happening. Because when you understand why it's happening, it takes away all the shame and guilt. How could it have not have happened, right? And it had to have happened based on the way your experiences were. That's just how our minds and bodies respond. So trauma, unresolved trauma, creates inflammation in the body. Inflammation compromises our immune system and compromises our neurotransmitters. So we're going to get sicker and we're going to feel bad. Well, how could you not have that happen if you experience that? So that's why I say there's nothing wrong with you. What I find happens is that by the time we're two hours in and you understand and I explain why your mind's doing what it's doing, all the guards come down. There's no more fear of it where a lot of times where people can't remember things or they've basically spent their life trying to block those things, when they feel safe, their mind will then open up. And then we only work on generally three uh, events. And so we'll pick three different events. I'll take you through the techniques to basically get your mind to reset them. And I don't spend more than two minutes on an, an event. And so what I'll say is I want a highlight reel So I want you to have like a minute, two minute highlight reel. Think about movie trailer, right? Mm -hmm. And we can do it where you can talk about it. If you feel comfortable in talking about it Two, I can do it all visually. I have no idea sometimes what the trauma is that I'm clearing. They don't have to share it at all. Interesting. Or the third way is I have you tell me what happened to you, but I'm going to give you a new language to tell me. I'm going to teach you a new language today. And it's called flowing. And there's only one word in the flowing language and it's flowing. So instead of (laughs) saying, I walked into the room, you'd say flowing, flowing, flow. Every word's flowing. You have to go into memory to even say flowing. All I need you to do is start pulling up the information from memory. As you do that, I have you in a very relaxed, focused state. So I have you in an alpha brainwave state and where the memory that you had was recorded in a very high beta state. So this is a really interesting and why the program is so effective and fast is if you sit down in traditional therapy to start talking about trauma, you're gonna be talking about a high beta stored memory, but you're still gonna be in the same state that you experienced it because you're living right through it right now. By the time we get two hours into the end of the program, you're in a very relaxed alpha brainwave state and it provides the counter to it. So now when we bring in a two minute highlight reel of a high beta memory, the dominant state is alpha and it reprocesses it into alpha, takes all the intensity out of it. And that's why within two, three minutes, we can relieve that trauma that quickly. So will you, can you give us an example of how that might work? Um, 
where someone comes in and they maybe have childhood trauma, um, what would be like, let's pretend I'm your patient right now okay, or your client or whatever. And I'm completely making this up. Okay. I'm, <laughs> <That's good. laughs> so, <Qualify that. laughs> I'm completely making this up, but let's say that there was an event in childhood, um, where my friend said that I was not attractive mm -hmm. and that made me feel like I wasn't good enough. Right. And then that was, that was a, a constant striving then of like, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. And then that drives that sense of perfectionism and that drives that sense of achievement. Um, and I can't get out of it. And so then I grow up into adulthood and it's like, I'm chronically stressed and I'm chronically overextending myself, trying to please everybody else. And I'm not ever taking time for myself. Right. So how do I heal from that? How do I go back to that experience and make it non-traumatic so that it stops impacting my behaviors today? So the first thing I would say um, is, okay, when you think about that event right now, you don't have to share it with me right now. I just want you to see it in your own mind. Can you tell me if you feel an emotion as you're thinking about it without sharing it, without talking about it? Can you feel an emotion? Yes. So if you remember what we talked about in the education part, why does your mind create an emotion for, to, an, action? for an action? Yep. Right. Okay. So what your mind's trying to get you to do is stop them from saying it or fight back or say something about it. Right. It's trying to protect you. It's trying to get you into a way to respond to that event. Is that possible to respond to that event now? No. A glitch. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that memory. So I'm looking for a minute, two minutes. We can do it where you can talk about it. We can do it where we do it just visually, or you can tell me what happened in flowing. And the reason I use flowing too is because a lot of times, you know, if they've had a sexual assault, the last thing they want to do is sit there talking about it. Right. So generally I'll use flowing or a visual technique. Um, there, there's occasionally some people will say, well, I can talk about it. So I have a number of different techniques, depending on, you know, which one I want to use at which time. And then I'll just take you through about a two minute highlight reel. So for example, when you're in a dominant alpha brainwave state, that's where the mind does restoration. It'll start to reprocess. What we have found is we do brain mapping on people. And what we have discovered is if you have post-traumatic stress or trauma, right, the occipital lobes are lit up. So what does that mean? You're seeing it. You're seeing it. So now I know that that's where the problem is, but your mind is seeing it in real time because the logical reasonable part of your brain, which is our 5% conscious mind, cannot handle, does not have any involvement when there's a threat. Logic and reason are out the window. Survival yeah. takes over. So the reason you're feeling the emotion is because the survival part of your brain has started to respond to this event that it thinks is happening now, and it wants you to do something. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take you through a process. So I'll give you an example of one I would do. I'd say, I want you to think about that event in 10 pictures. Picture number one would be right before the event started. So they haven't said it to you yet. Maybe you're just hanging out, right? Picture number 10 will be it's over. They're, they're not there. You're not dealing with them right now. So can you see what picture number one is? And the people yes. will say, yes. Can you see where you are in picture number 10? You could be back home, but you're basically in a safe place again. Mm -hmm. right? So we know what one and 10 are. We don't know yet what two through nine are until your mind wants to show you. But I'm going to take you through a process with your eyes closed. You don't have to describe it. I just want you to see it. And I take them through the process of viewing those pictures. And then we do a quick breathing exercise to activate the parasympathetic. After we've done the 10 pictures, I go forward, backward, forward, backward, right? And then I mix them up. And then I'll do the breathing exercise to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. And then I'll say, now open up your eyes. And when they open up their eyes, I say, go back over it again now and tell me if it looks and feels different. And people are like, oh my gosh. 
Like, how do you do that that fast? Right. So I, had, I had a U.S. Army sniper who had to shoot and kill a 12-year-old boy. Very dramatic. By the time we finished that sequence of events, he could then talk about it without crying and shaking and says, how did you do this? And I said, I didn't do anything. I said, for eight years, your mind's been trying to get you not to pull the trigger. We just reset that information. Your mind knows there's no action required. All the intensity is out of it. Your mind's not going to call. So I'm almost doing the opposite of what they did with the Wizard of Oz. They took it from black and white to color. We're going from color to black and white. Mm -hmm. And then your mind doesn't feel threatened. So it's kind of like the event is still there, but they accept that they can't do anything about it. Yeah. Because is that, is that yeah. the premise of this? Like they know it's there, but again, it's like, it's not in color. It's in black and white. They know it's there, but because they've been through the experience again in the alpha wave state or that more meditative, calm and relaxed state, instead of the normal beta wave where they're used to going through it, where it happened, then the next time I'm guessing, cause I'm at least in my experience, there's usually a next time that that memory pops up. They're more they're The program of their brain has now kind of been reset to the, um, the lower alpha wavelength. So it doesn't trigger the same fight or flight mode. It then reminds them of that, that nice session with Dr. Don about how they're safe and there's nothing they can do about that. And they can kind of let it go. Yeah. And not even let it go. There's no action required. So the, so they won't feel the emotion anymore. So Rebecca Gregory from the Boston marathon bombing, she was four feet from the first bomb that went off. She lost her left leg, right? She suffered for five and a half years with post-traumatic stress. So when she came in to see me, we took her through the whole process and she, on the sixth anniversary, she said, I'm going to really test this. I'm going back to the uh, Boston Marathon. I'm going to stand right where I was when the bomb went off at the exact time when the church bells ring. And she sent me a picture from her standing there because this wouldn't have been possible. I couldn't stand here and watch this before mm -hmm. because what happened is her mind would have saw what was going on, would have heard the bells, would have known what time it was, would have gone into memory and said, what do we know about these experiences? And it would have done what I call a Google search. Your mind is constantly searching for how do we respond to this event? Um, I discovered a, a, a something called the time slice theory. And it was developed by two scientists at the University of Zurich that said, is consciousness streaming? And what they discovered is, is consciousness is not streaming. It is to your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind takes in all the information in real time processes it and then sends time slices to the conscious mind but there's a 400 millionth of a second gap in between the slices which means your subconscious is seeing it in real time responding 400 millionths of a second before you're even aware of it so what it's doing in that 400 millionths of a second is a google search what do we know about where we're standing what do we know about that person that sound that noise that smell and then when it does this Google search, what's it going to do? Pull up all the information about that event, start viewing it. And then when does it think the event's happening? Now. Now. Activates the nervous system. It's a perfectly designed system, right? The problem is it's glitching. Yeah. I think that's a, I think the big, big takeaway that I got from that was there's no action required now. Right. And like, so I think for anyone who's listening, who feels like they've, they've had trauma, they've been through trauma, they feel like they're in that fight or flight mode. I think just what Dr. Don said of like going back to that situation in a calm meditative state, if you can, I think there's nothing better than this, than an in-person, um, ideally in person, but virtual is better than nothing session to help someone guide you through this process of being in that traumatic place, but in a calmer state and recognizing that your brain wants to take an action, but there's no action to be taken. And so you're safe and you can, you can kind of be calm now. Did I describe that? Well, yeah, very well. So what happens is, is that once we do two or three of these events, when you go to sleep at night in theta, when you go into a theta sleep, your mind processes what it learned. So that's why I only do about two or three of them, 
because mm -hmm. then your mind starts resetting all of that data. So I've had people tell me that, you know, my wife was an example. You know, a lot of people think they have to go through every single event. And right. I said, no, you don't. Once we start the resetting process, our minds and bodies are designed to heal. So it'll take this process now and start processing all that data. It's, yeah. it's brilliant. It's really pretty powerful. And it's actually quite simple. Like once you really think about it and once you understand the, it's not easy, but I think if we can distill it to its most basic premise is like your brain is not broken. Your brain is trying to help and it's trying to protect you and it's trying to keep you safe. And there's no action that needs to be taken now. Like exactly. that's, that's a huge line for me. So let's, let's kind of move on in the conversation into an area where we know that this trauma can manifest as fatigue and it can manifest as chronic illness. Why, why does trauma, why is there such a strong link between trauma and then physical manifestations? Well, the mind is actually constantly activating, right? So if it loops through this trauma all the time, it's going to continue to activate the system. So what does it do when it activates our nervous system response? The adrenals, cortisol, all of those things start to flood into the system. And if that continues to go on, you're going to get fatigue. You're going to get chronic fatigue because it's like your system is turned on all the time. Now that can't happen in the animal world, right? So if a rabbit, for example, gets, so emotions, feelings, sensations are all calls for actions. So we know what the sensation of hunger feels like, right? But why does our mind use the sensation of hunger? Because it wants us to eat. Why does it want us to eat? To survive. So if a rabbit gets a sensation of hunger, rabbit's mind has produced a sensation to get rabbit into an action. So the rabbit now starts eating carrots, looks up and sees a wolf. What's going to happen to the sensation of hunger? It's going to shut off, replaced by the more appropriate response is fear. Fear is designed to make the rabbit strong, alert, and motivated. So now the rabbit gets a lot of blood flow, right? Takes off, gets into a rabbit hole. She can't see the wolf, hear the wolf, smell the wolf. What's going to happen to fear? Shuts off. Perfectly designed system, activated in the situation that was appropriate, turned off in the same situation. The problem is, is we store explicit details about wolves. And so anytime something looks like, sounds like, smells like a wolf, even though there isn't a wolf, or it's a memory of a wolf, our system gets activated. It's not supposed to do that. It's an emergency system, but it turns into an operating system. And if your system is in constant operation, responding to memory, it's going to burn out the system, yeah. which is going to affect health. And we have so much battery power, right, to deal with these pathogens and things like that to get into our system. Well, if you don't have enough energy, then they overwhelm the system and you start getting sick. That's why you see people get you know, colds, flus, COVID, all of those kinds of things are coming because the power is so reduced that the immune system doesn't have enough strength. Yeah. And I have an interview tomorrow with um, the author of the cellular wellness solution. And he talks about that explicitly, like, you know, your cells are designed to kind of protect you, but if you're not, if you're chronically stressed, whether it's, um, you know, oxidative stress or psych, uh, psychological stress, even too much physical stress, your protection barrier kind of fades. And then those um, infections can kind of grow. So there's just cells in our bodies that they're designed to grow and they're designed to overtake things. And if your immune system is hampered by that chronic low grade inflammation, which can stem from a poor diet, or like we're talking about here, that constant activation of the fight or flight mode from, um, a glitch, you know, in your subconscious brain, that's going to drive chronic disease and fatigue. So I, I thought that was a really important piece because there's a lot of people out there experiencing some of those symptoms and their doctor just doesn't have a good answer for them because the, a pill is not going to fix this. A pill is not going to fix the glitch. No, no. Mm -hmm. So 
And you, you look at inflammation. Inflammation is actually a function, not a dysfunction. It's, the, it's designed, the inflammation goes into a, the cells are in a cell danger response to protect the system from any foreign invaders, right? While there's a threat going on. So it's designed to protect you. The problem is, is it stays on. Mm -hmm. It's not meant to stay on. So it keeps looping. And so that's what my daughter's Crohn's was all about. She had Crohn's, right? And I believe it goes to the weakest genetic link in the body. So for her, that was her intestinal tract. So the inflammation stays there and her cells become inflamed to protect anything from penetrating it. But it's a temporary measure. It's meant to turn on while the danger is active and then come out of inflammation when the system can come back in and start restoration. The problem is her memory of what happened to her as a child started looping and stayed active. So the cell danger response stayed in an active state. And because your subconscious mind, right, your survival brain has no connection to time, it doesn't know if it's been turned on for a minute or 20 years. Right. It's that's, the same thing. And that's fascinating and a little bit scary at the same time. Um, another question I wanted to be sure that I got to today was your opinion on addiction, because I've worked with many people who feel they have a true addiction to food, specifically sweet foods. Um, and so you have a different belief about addiction. You kind of say it's a code, not a disease. Um, and you talk about, you talk about like the function versus the dysfunction. So can you speak to your beliefs on addiction and how it might relate to people who are really struggling with feeling that addiction towards sweet foods? Yeah. So the reason you like sweet foods is because if you've had any kind of trauma, any kind of stress, right? Well, you want to feel better. So how do you feel better? You eat the food, you take the drink, you take whatever it is, right? Is just a resource for your mind. And why I say addiction is not a disease is because people stop it every day, right? All of a sudden, people will just stop drinking, stop taking drugs, start overeating. So a disease generally is something that's a dysfunction, right? It's a dis-ease. But I believe that what happens is if you have pain and that pain keeps looping, and then what you find is that when I take that donut or I take that chocolate and I feel better, isn't that what your mind was trying to do to stop the pain? But then we have two memory systems. We have that explicit memory system where we store all the e information, the details about events and experiences. We have a second memory system, which the animals have as well. The memory system that we share with animals is that associative repetitive memory. So if we want to learn how to ride a bike, play a guitar, right? We repeat it over and over. I believe what our brains are doing are building codes, right? On how to repeat it subconsciously. So you don't have to think about, it. you don't need a conscious decision. It's a subconscious code that was built to basically repeat it. The more you repeat something, then the code becomes very active. It's like a neural pathway. Yes, yeah. So as soon as you feel the pain of shame or guilt or whatever it is, right? Your mind says, oh, we know how to fix this. Go get a donut, right? And because your subconscious mind has no connection to time, when does it want the pain to stop? Now, it solved the problem. Your subconscious, because it has no connection to time, cannot see consequences to actions. That's an important point. Like if people were kind of dozing off or doing laundry or doing dishes um, <laughs> or yeah, telling their kid to be quiet in the back seat, like me sometimes, <laughs> will you please repeat that line? That was really important. So the subconscious mind is survival based. And if you're feeling pain and it operates in the present, it wants the pain to stop now. So when you take that substance with a donut or whatever it is, and you temporarily stop that pain, it solved the problem. It can't see consequences to actions because it has no connection to time. It's the conscious mind that can say, I shouldn't eat this donut. I shouldn't be eating this food. This is going to put on weight. I'm going to get sick. I'm going to get fat. 
right? But your subconscious mind goes, not interested in hearing that. I solved the problem now. <laughs> yeah. And it only sees now as a solution. So give us, give us a more, um, a solution that serves our health, maybe a little bit better. Um, I've done a lot of research into how do we change thoughts? How do we impact our subconscious mind? Um, and so I'm just really curious to add to my own toolbox to be able to share with, um, our Zivli members in the community, some things that we can really do to kind of stop those sugar cravings and stop that near addiction to sweets, whether it's sugar or artificial sweeteners. So where would you take a client with that? Well, the first thing is I try to decide with them, is it coming from trauma? Because if it is coming from trauma, so it can come from two sources. If it comes from trauma, we need to get to the root of it. Because if you heard as a child, like you described earlier, I'm not good enough, right? I'm not likable, right? Then you're trying to fit in. So we have to get to that first. That can create a code to be built on because you repeated something over and over. But somebody can also get into addiction, even if it wasn't related to trauma. Maybe, and I, and I talk about this because if you grew up in a home that food was plentiful, it became something that you did, it was a part of family celebrations, you could get stuck in a code without any trauma because what do you want to do every time you have these family feasts or you have a lot of food? What is your mind saying? Eat. I'm in, I eat because I'm feeling safe. I'm feeling loved, right? Because it reminds me of my childhood, reminds me of, you know, my, my safety around my parents, around my family. So that may not be coming from trauma, but a code got built very early in your life, an association, because that second memory system is associative, repetitive memory. It's how, for example, if you have a dog, do you have any pets? No, we have no. two kids and they're four and two. And so for <laughs> us, that's enough responsibility right now. <laughs> yeah. So if you had a dog, for example, right? Dogs don't store memory about events and experiences. So you can feed your dog the same thing every day because they don't remember eating that yesterday. This that's is just a meal now. Yeah. Right. So if you um, repeat that over and over, right, the dog doesn't remember you feeding them yesterday, but they've built an association of you and food, but they don't right. know why. They just know that they're going to be safe and you're going to feed them. But they have, you know, it's the Pavlov dog yeah. right, experiment where they could teach a dog, right, that as soon as they saw the person walk in the room, right, they knew that that meant food. That was an association. So if you've gotten stuck in one of these associative patterns, it's because the only way to break that is to create a new neural pathway that becomes different, right? That also serves the same purpose, right? Which is to make you feel safe or loved or whatever it is. But that, that's really the only way is repetition association. But if it's coming from trauma, fix the trauma first and then work on the codes. Because if you work on the codes, but you haven't fixed the trauma, the trauma is still loop, looping and yep. it can activate those old codes, uh, old codes very quickly. Yeah. But it, but did you say if it's more associative, it's more just kind of embedding new thoughts and beliefs through repetition to kind of fix that code? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. your mind won't make a quick change. So when people say, oh, I should be able to just stop this instantly. The mind will keep reminding you about the old code. So I always say, if you walk two miles every day to get food, but on that two mile trip, there were snipers and landmines, but every day you got there and you got back. And then somebody goes, why are you doing that? There's a Publix down the road, you know, a supermarket down the road. There's lights. Police is really safe. Your mind doesn't know that to be true. So it will take the path that it knows it can do. So the only way is you got to start walking down that new road every day until your mind goes, oh, this is a better route. We'll take that route now. Yeah. And, it's and literal. Just a quick question there too. I always like asking this to people. How long do you feel like it takes typically for people to um, re recode their brains to make a different choice? For example, um, they don't want to eat sweets after dinner. 
And that was just an associated thing. They always had dessert growing up, um, or sweet was their comfort. So they're working on a new kind of, maybe there's no trauma associated with it. We'll just kind of assume that to keep it simple. How long do you feel like it takes? I'd say 21 days is probably safe as a minimum and anything that you can do, but don't just stop at 21 days, make it a habit, right? And stick to it. So you'll find it becomes easier and easier, but I find that generally about 21 days is a pretty good time. And so I have audios that they listen to for, for 30 days. So it just sort of goes even past that, but we're building new neural pathways in those 30 days. Like some meditative or guided meditations is what you have. Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah. It was, was all built stories, metaphors, because the subconscious mind communicates through stories, symbols, and metaphors. So it's all built on communicating with that part of the brain to say, here's a safer way. Can we, so think about repetition as research. Your subconscious mind wants data. How do I, you tell me that this is a better way. I don't know that, right? Give me more data. So every day you repeat it. It's like research for the mind. Then the mind goes, okay, I've got enough research now. I'll make the switch. Yes. So I'm really big. Um, my Zivli members know like reading your uh, intention for the day, whatever you want to call it, like your personal faith formula, your definite purpose, like your wellness vision statement. I'm really big on reading that first thing in the morning to get that thought repetition first thing before you have to make any choices for the day. Um, do you have, I know we have like about a couple minutes left. That's one really practical thing that I have found so powerful for my own behavior change and clients. Do you have like one practical tip that you wanted to leave us with? Um, if you're getting stuck in those kinds of thought patterns, right? What you have to do is you have to shift gears. Think about it in this terms. I have to shift gears. So a good way to shift gears is to close your eyes for a second, right? And have whatever you want to shift into prepared in advance. So because if you try to think about it when you're in stress, it's like, have you ever met somebody at a mall and you try to remember their name and you can't remember it? And then they walk away and you go, that yes. was porch. Yes. Right? So when yeah. we're stressed, we don't do that really well. So if we close our eyes, right, that shuts down the stimulus coming in. And then what we do is say, what do I want to shift to? But you have already what your planned thoughts could be. So have your pre-planned thoughts to shift. And then yeah. it's easy to find them and then go, awesome. all right, here's what I'm going to do. Perfect. Oh, we're so aligned on this. And I've really appreciated your time today. I definitely learned things. And this is again, going to be one that I go and I re-listen to again. I think sometimes when I can re-listen to it, I absorb different things than I do during the interview. Um, thank you so much. I know that this has been such a personal passion of yours for your wife and your daughter, um, and that you get great results with your clients. Um, can you please let people know where they can learn more about you and the tip method? Um, yeah, if you want to find more information, we're all over Instagram and everything else, but our site, if you go to get tip, G E T T I P P.com, you'll get all that information or our website, which is inspired performance Institute.com. Thank you so much, Dr. Don. I feel like I, I personally want to check your books out as well. Um, I'll link those in the show notes for this episode, as well as your website. And I really appreciate your expertise and time today. Thank you, Morgan. I really appreciated the uh, time. Yep. Bye. Take care.